in the gamification area that's probably not new for anyone of you guys. Uh, this, this was meant to be a very introductory um, session, just for anyone who's kind of new to the concept of gamification, or since it's kind of a buzzword anyways, it's probably, uh, the first part will be a bit of what, it, it, what we understand on the gamification than what just shall says it is, or might be considered uh, as, and uh, then a couple of things, a um, couple of these key points, and uh, in the last part of the session I just want to quickly um, give you such a short or two short examples of how I recently uh, work with the insurance company, uh, we kind of applied of what he, what he does, or what, we didn't really sit down with this concept, but probably we, in, in retrospective, look at what we did and try to describe it the way he, he frames it. Um, so just very, very quickly, gamification I mean, is definitely a buzzword. There's 150,000 meanings of what it could mean. Um, what we kind of, what everybody I think is, is a, agrees on is the, one of the, the broadest and probably most common definition uh, out there is that it's just very broadly the use of game design elements and not in game context. Um, in, this is also used to kind of differentiate it from some other things uh, which are related to the field, uh, which is very small that you know you can read it. But this was like kind of a grid uh, where you, how you can put, put gamification and other things apart. Um, there's this two, two axes basically. One is, um, differentiates playing versus gaming. And just, you know, in, in Shell's concept and, and Deja Dane's concept and other people who wrote about it, the differentiation between playing and gaming is mainly, uh, well, playing is more playing around with things. Uh, we don't have the differentiation of it, even language-wise in German, where everything is spielen. Um, but, uh, but playing and gaming, probably playing is more, you play around, there's no clear set of rules there's no clear set of goals. Uh, you just basically you're probably acting with people around. You just you just producing different ideas, imagination, and that kind of stuff. Um, and also, so this is probably what, what comes up here. Um, it's kind of rules and goals, which is mo the mo most common differentiation between playing and gaming. And then on the on the other axis, you could say that on this, this side, there's, there's a whole product, a closed product, or a closed idea, a closed system, and the other thing is this is parts of a, of a system. So you could, you could say that over here you'd find, in, in this corner, you'd say, okay, there's fixed rules, fixed goals, and it's a whole closed system, so this is what you could consider a whole game, right? Anything from a board game to, say, a serious game, uh, something you create to for, for a specific purpose in the case of a, of a serious game or something for you create as a closed game environment for a specific entertainment purpose where you would create the closed product. Um, on, the, on the more playing side of things, this would probably be toys, right? Where you, where you just where you create something which is, say, Lego toys or something. It's, it's a closed product you can play around with. There's no real rules to it, but it's, uh, it's one closed, closed idea. Uh, and then the more you go towards parts is where, you, where we kind of locate the idea of gamification as also differentiated to, uh, from serious games is that gamification doesn't have to be a close the whole product uh, as, as to differentiate from a serious game for example where uh, in a serious game you might create an entire game experience close you enter it, you play it, you exit, you learn something on the way um, where gamification could be part of a process, um, could be the just the general elements of motivating people in a totally different structure. It might be small snippets uh, which you put into place at different stages of a process. So we kind of that's just just sort of what, what we kind of regard as uh, when we talk about gamification. But we sometimes use the term game thinking. We also use that one in the in the meetup description, I think, um, just to differentiate a bit from, from real proper big games. Um, which is also when we when we work with clients, um, we usually start with like gamification things. Some people don't want 
that we find out and they, they want like serious games experiments where they are actually looking for a complete game where we didn't say, okay, maybe we might have the capabilities to develop that or you have to be aware that this might be a really big investment that you want to do. Um, whereas maybe if you're just looking at certain specific issues that you have with the process that you're working on, uh, that you have with a, a product that you have, that you have with um, say motivational uh, design for your employees or learning experiences where you can just put in certain tools basically or use uh, different tools at certain stages without creating an entire experience. So this is just very quickly, um, we can, I mean there's some people who, uh, who kind of disagree with, with it there but I, I like the dichotomy of it. Um, one of the um, one of the good points, I think, in, in Shell's talks and in his book, uh, when, he, when you look at what he, what he does, um, is he really um, looked a bit deeper into the psychology behind gaming. And um, for him, basically, gamifying an experience or gamifying the process um, is really to pleasurize it. So that's why he calls it the pleasure revolution. Um, so when he when he looks at things, he kind of um, um, say say he, he's looking at a process. For example, I have to do my homework, right? Then um, that you already in the description of the process, you already have the have to English like American kind of wording for I have to thinking in the uh, in the very framing of of the task you're talking about, um, which psychologically. Uh, works in the avoidance of negative consequences part of your brain. So he kind of goes deeper into psychology when he when he looks at this. And um, and I in my in my previous life before being a game dude, I, I also worked on emotions a bit. <clears throat> and he's actually quite right about the in like psychologically and brain wise, there's a there's a big difference on how we handle uh, events or tasks where the motivation is to avoid negative consequences versus those where we're seeking pleasure. Um, so basically for him, it, this whole gamification, pleasurization, where he has many different um, words for it, is really the process of turning things, or taking things from the have to uh, side of, of your imagination or of your, of your brain uh, into the want to side of all things, where you actually see positive consequences instead of um, avoiding negative ones. Um, he has a couple of um, points which are very, very clear, say something that we consider a duty, something like work, um, usually it's on the have to side of the brain, and, um, and uh, on, on, on the want to side there's, there's fun, there's play, there's pleasure, there's the freedom to decide if we want to do it, and one of the most interesting points I found in his stuff is, uh, is the idea of efficiency, usually. Uh, and this is very interesting when you talk to any kind of uh, HR or any kind of uh, yeah, work structure person. Basically, that efficiency usually is a very avoid negative consequences kind of way of, to think about processes. Uh, as, as opposed to um, making something pleasurable um, or in yet, because efficiency really is the, um, the, the main example of, of avoiding um, the negative consequences. He has a very, in his talk, he's a very funny example when he, when he talks about the idea of efficiency. For example, in, um, in when, you, when, you, when you decide to go on a holiday, um, to, this is quoted from his talk, you decide on a, to go on a holiday to the Caribbean, and uh, someone would tell you, hey, uh, come up with a way how you can do your trip in five days instead of two weeks. And you'd be like, why the hell would I do that? And um, so basically, this is the whole, yeah. <coughs> why he puts the, the uh, efficiency part in the, in, the, in the half side of things. So then if we, if we look at how to make things more pleasurable, um, he gives some, uh, also <coughs> from psychology side of things, some advice on how to do it. The, um, and the main, the main mistake um, people make, according to him, um, 
is that games or even like making something pleasurable, if you want to, are not only about fun. So there's a big difference about uh, between saying something has to be fun and something has to be pleasurable, um, which might strike a bit, uh, might, might, might be a bit weird at the, at the very beginning. But when you, when you, I mean, you, you're probably all interested in games or, or gamers uh, or at least casually sometimes uh, play things. Um, you you'll probably witness that it's not always about the immediate fun and the ridicule and the it can it can be quite stressful. You can you can it can be an exhausting experience to play a game. Uh, it can be uh, yeah, it can be uh, all sorts of things. You can scream at your screen. At least I do sometimes. I sometimes get so pissed off that I like turn on my computer or smash my mouse into the uh, keyboard. Um, but um, what he what he really looks at is. Um, it's um, something in, in psychology which is called self-determination self theory, um, which um, I don't know the um, psychological uh, concepts actually from, but the, um, w what they say, and it, it makes a lot of sense to me, is that um, apart from physical needs that a human being has to feel well, there's a couple of psychological needs that someone has to ha have fulfilled to feel well. And um, there's really three main things in that concept. One is the feeling of competence. Um, so basically the, the general need that I as a human want to be good at things. So I want to feel that I'm achieving things, um, which usually includes um, in then it includes beating challenges, uh, finding solutions, uh, understanding, um, different patterns and rules of, of behavior, consequences, say A causes B, and therefore I do C. This is something that's very pleasurable as a human to find out. And um, when we look at, um, yeah, basically, then he, then he explains why this, um, this need for competence um, that, that humans have is very easily served by games because the very structure of games usually involves being interesting challenges. Um, you, have, you have clear goals set ahead of you. So in, in, in the feeling that you accomplish these goals is a very positive feedback to you as a human. Um, you also, um, yeah, we don't run into that, whatever, I don't know what that point was. Um, <laughs> the other thing is the, um, the feeling of um, relatedness. Um, which um, which you could also um, and digitally calls it that way is 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 the need for meaning. So um, things you do um, should have some kind of meaning for you. This can be uh, through joining the experience with other with other players. So you can create meaning and a sense of community. Um, where you agree on, on certain things that are valuable for you, which might be totally arbitrary to someone who's not part of the community. Why is it important for you that you have a specific title behind your virtual avatar name? Doesn't make, a, make any sense to someone who's not sharing the same, same sense of meaning, but it's something that is very uh, inherently important for a human as well to feel well. Um, it can be the embeddedness in a, in a larger story, it can be um, also be the possibility in a game sense to not only have um, clear goals set, but also for you to set your own goals. Say when you when you're in a broader uh, game, which has more than a very linear story, where it's about beating challenge A, B, C up, and then D afterwards, is you're you're set and you're given the freedom to choose your own goals and get attached meaning to these achievements, basically. And then this leads, like this point kind of melts into the next one is the sense of autonomy, which is very important for, uh, for to, to feel well as a human according to uh, self-determination theory, um, which is really the, um, it makes you feel well as a human to be able to decide what you do. Um, this, this feeling of agency uh, gives, you, gives you a feeling of empowerment. Um, which also is in, at the very basis of, um, of everything that we would call a game or a play, is that it's voluntary. It's one of the main things that you also find in, the, uh, in almost every de um, definition of what a game actually is, 
it's usually that you have some rules and you have some goals, and also you do it voluntarily. Um, so basically, A, the, um, the, the, uh, the decision to actually engage in the process is your own, and then, um, but you have to be, um, you have to be kind of, uh, when, you, when you then design games, you also have to be careful with a couple of, um, of, uh, of things which, which can interfere with this, uh, with this need for, for autonomy. Um, one is um, if you apply, say, the game rules and kind of things to, to something which is a voluntary process, normally um, you could destroy that sense of uh, autonomy. And uh, you could also um, devaluate a certain activity by uh, externally rewarding it. Um, that's something lots of the gamification authors, bloggers are very obsessed with. Um, there is a book um, by Cohn, Alfie Cohn. It's called Punished by Rewards. Um, it's I don't really agree with m most of what's said in there. Um, he really bashes the idea of giving external re extrinsic rewards for behavior. Um, he has this example of school kids, uh, which is also an infamous example. School kids are given the opportunity to draw pictures, and then group one is told you get a dollar for every picture you draw, and group B doesn't get a dollar, they, they just get to draw pictures. And uh, so in, in this first step of the experiment, all the kids which get a dollar produce far more pictures of lower quality and the others are just enjoying themselves. And then the second step of the experiment, um, the, um, the reward is taken away. So basically the teacher leaves the room, there's no more dollar for drawing pictures. And where the group that usually got the dollar before stops drawing pictures, it sits there and why should I draw a picture? The others are still happy just to draw pictures, right? Because it, it was something they enjoyed in the first place that was just kind of destroyed by the extrinsic reward. Um, and I think, I don't, I don't argue with that experiment. It's probably very true, um, but it's a very limited setting, right? It's, it, it's tested with children for a very specific activity. Um, and in general, when you look at how what every uh, psychological piece of research basically shows over the last 30 years is that extrinsic rewards can work pretty fine. So it's, it's not really some, a good idea to just completely come down the idea of extrinsic rewards. And a lot of the gamification people, basically for them, the extrinsic reward is the devil. So you always have to aim for extrinsic, more intrinsic motivation. But in order to reach it, I think you can, you can totally work with, uh, with certain rewards that you set to guide um, any kind of behavior. What's a good example then? Sorry? What's a good example of extrinsic rewards then? Um, <coughs> well, anything you, anything you, you train, um, say you, um, you, you're supposed to practice your, um, um, your music instrument or something, and you you just you, you get something which isn't intrinsically rewarded in the in the experience of let's you know getting better. That that would be the perfect scenario if you're just a kid who or an, an adult who uh, who happens to be very happy with the process of getting better and the, the results you get. Whereas um, sometimes if you if you're giving extrinsic rewards, as in um, you you can even give them to yourself, you reward yourself with a nice drink after you've done something, um, then it doesn't have to automatically devaluate the experience of experience of, uh, of, of, of achieving something on, on the one hand, while it might be a very good motivation to just to get you going in the first place. But I mean, we could probably discuss this uh, later. Um, yeah, um, this, is, this is basically um, his talk about the pleasure revolution. So he basically, his main uh, his main point to sum up is to uh, to think about gamification more of the idea of creating more pleasure as opposed to more fun uh, with certain experiences. Um, he usually he's actually one of the people who don't like the term gamification. He he usually uh, advocates. The more complicated phrase, phrasing of improving motivational design of things or processes or something like that. 
So he's, he's like um, a proposal, proposal of that term, improvement of motivational design, but it's like it's a pretty um, complicated term. So, so, he, um, so he has this pleasure revolution kind of thing framed, and he um, basically, the underlying thing is to take things from avoiding negative consequences into seeking positive um, rewards. Um, to do that, you don't only look at fun, but you actually look at what pe what makes people feel good about themselves, which we find in self determination theory. So that's uh, that's Chad's talk about pleasure evolution. Yeah. Uh, so questions, thoughts about that? Maybe before we go into the uh, go into the how we kind of applied it, or how we what we did, and how we could probably look at it with this perspective. If anybody has anything to add? <laughs> Another one then, like the, the homework example. Yeah. Could you gamify that to make it more fun? To make homework as such more fun? Yeah, if a kid doesn't want to do his homework. Yeah. Like the, the obvious problem there is that the kid doesn't have autonomy there. Yeah, exactly. Something you have to do. Yeah. Could you fix that in gamification? You probably couldn't fix the, the general concept of homework, and it would be weird to say you can fix anything with gamification, but you could look at what's the, what's the underlying purpose of the homework. You could say, okay, um, instead of you know, avoiding the consequence of the teacher punishing me the next day if I haven't done my homework, I could just look at what is actually the, the idea behind the homework. You could look at, okay, I need to be able to solve equation one or need to learn this vocabulary and you basically before you start with the concept of homework which is already on the on the very have to side of things you don't try to take homework to the other side but you look at what's actually what you actually want to achieve and then look at if you how can you put this the things you want to achieve on the other side of the spectrum where you where you um, where you actually work with things like um, like uh, autonomy where you give people an idea of um, that they can kind of choose uh, what they, when they want to do it, how they want to do it. Maybe give them different ways of how to learn vocabulary. Maybe there's you know you can propose different kind of settings on how how to learn vocabulary, and you can say okay, this is the most fun for me. And instead of saying I have to do this, you can you, you, you add an option, a bit of choice. Um, you maybe give. Um, you embed it in something that has actually meaning to the kid, right? Where mostly the, one of the most problems for, for that you that you face with people who want who need to learn things is that they that they block off the meaning. When when they accept that this is something they want to do, then you don't really have the problem that people um, not only from from an autonomy perspective, but also that when they when they accept the meaning of knowing um, a certain thing that they have to learn. And it's already you already a step closer to them to actually do it and enjoy what they're doing. So maybe you can you can embed um, embed the the learning material in a story. Maybe you can um, give them um, or let them, let them share certain 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 means that they attach um, to a certain um, uh, topic with with other people. Exchange it. Maybe set their own goals or something. Probably. I can just tell from my perspective, I always did it when I was when I went to school. For me, for example, vocabulary, it was, it, I, I always gamified it in the way, I, it's always a mixture between gamification and storytelling. But for example, I just always, it's a bit schiz uh, schizophrenic as well, but uh, I just always invented people who played against each other in kind of a quiz show. And so it was. It was really uh, exciting to learn vocabulary because there were sometimes those really hard questions, and it was about a lot of money. And it was really, I was really uh, suffering with my imaginary friends. <laughs> <laughs> so no, but it, it really works absolutely. And I'm always in the same for I don't know all this biology thing. Just imagining that it's real fights that take place in your body to learn the difference between cells and mitochondria and whatever. I think it works completely for, for school things. <coughs> cool. <laughs> and we also want to uh, give some schizophrenic examples of their lives. <laughs> I've actually well, one question now, because you were asking um, what is an example for an extrinsic motivation that um, um, works. Um, so it's just, are you skeptic about it or are you just curious? 
Do you think? Do you disagree that it would work? I think in almost all cases you really destroy your intrinsic motivation and you don't really know you devalue the activity by giving money for it. And I, I find that if you build on your own intrinsic motivation that you already have, you can expand it using some of these techniques. You can add stuff to build upon your own intrinsic motivation. But like the example of giving yourself a, a cold drink after fitness doesn't really work, isn't an extrinsic motivation. It is you give it to yourself and it's not going to end at any point. So you can always keep giving it to yourself. So extrinsic motivation that other people give to you and that they can also like, take away at some point. That like, I think those if, are- If you look at it this way, yes. The, the way I understood, or maybe I'm wrong, the way I understood extrinsic motivation is really when you look at not only like someone else, like if the extrinsic doesn't have to be another person, but usually extrinsic versus extrinsic is the way I understood it was in intrinsic is actually inherent of the system or the process which yeah, yeah. you're working on. Yeah, like, so just giving you know. yourself a reward from outside that system or being given that by someone else, it like, but like it's, it's, always, it's you perfect. Can, you can always give your reward to yourself, it doesn't really matter, right? You can just make it part of the activity mm -hmm. and it just will keep on going forever. But we're looking at like trying to intervene in systems and changing stuff by adding the stuff there but usually adding the rewards forever isn't like feasible because if you could have the reward forever, then it becomes like sort of task support. Yeah. And you have one of the interventions where you add the reward for a limited period of time. Yeah. But like there is a nuance here, of course, if you reward people for taking the bike to work, that seems to work in some cases. So there are like nuances to, to do here. Yeah. But in yeah, those cases, fun. if you give a kid money to practice a piano, you're going to destroy the piano for the kid. Probably, yeah, it depends on the kid. I think the, 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 the no, I, I, no, I agree. The, the problem, I think, even with the, with the, with the experiment that he uses, uh, that, um, that's not Shell, that's, that's, the, that's the guy with the book up, which I forgot who it was, but I mentioned it earlier. Um, I think, of course, it's dangerous to interfere with something that's fun in the first place, but why would you do You wouldn't probably do it anyway. It's like, who would, I mean, it's, it's so logical to me that it's a bad idea to give a child money to draw a picture because he wants to draw the picture in the first place. So there's no, you don't have a motivational problem and then you don't add something to it usually because you, the, the person already does what it's supposed to do. Like, so, but if you, if you want a child to do something which it does not want to do, then it's a good idea to interfere motivationally. If you praise the child, is that external motivation? I mean, how is it different? Yes, the child? yes, it doesn't have to really be material. Yes, yeah, you, can use, um, you can use softer ways yeah. of extrinsic exactly. motivation, like in the Rocksmith, it's a video game where basically you learn to play guitar. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, you get a score, you get reward achievements uh, while running the guitar. It's a really a lot of fun. and. Um, I don't think that there is a problem with these kind of uh, extrinsic motivations. Mm. It can work very well, but giving money is quite extreme. Exactly. So that's that's probably. I mean, it's something that a lot of kind of more towards the populist uh, side of things researchers, especially in the U.S., tend to do is they come up with an example like you know giving money, which is the worst thing in the world to a kid, like the combination already sounds awful, and then you destroy drawing a kid, you know, a kid's fun with drawing a kid, because that's, that's the worst thing you can possibly do. When you say, extrinsic motivation might also be that the teacher says, well done, and everybody would say, cool, yeah, that's a good idea probably to tell the kid well done, and that's also extrinsic motivation. The, giving someone a dollar is the most extreme way probably, the coldest way of extrinsic motivation if you want. Okay, cool. Um, so <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna give you two short or do we have time for this or do you want to stop this? Or? I don't know what was that to you. I don't I don't have to talk about things. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, anyways, you, you, someone, if, if the, when the first person screams stop, I'm going to stop. Um, <laughs> in, the, in the project we worked on last year, um, we took, we were given a task to take a 
basically a stress prevention course uh, or a psychological health prevention course uh, into an app which was supposed to be fun to use. And um, so basically there were all sorts of different things in this course, different forms of how you learn something, how you're supposed to integrate it into your daily routines. And um, this all was part of a seminar structure for a course where you go every week and then um, you'd after six weeks, we're done with the course, and hopefully people learn something. You don't see it, uh, anybody ever again. Um, and one of the um, one of the one of the parts of this course was um, was the idea that people were supposed to do um, like a soft form of meditation called mindfulness. I don't know if you've heard of it. it doesn't really matter. It's it's a could you repeat that because I don't understand? It's not a form of meditation. Mindfulness. I would say it's a soft form of meditation. I don't, it comes from Zen, so I'm probably <laughs> wrong about it. But um, anyways, um, mindfulness is, is a concept where you basically gather yourself for a set amount of time. Um, you observe your own thoughts and your own focus and uh, see what things, what, what it does to you, basically. If you, if you, you can I'm, correct I'm, I'm going to come back. <laughs> well, yeah, you can Google it. <laughs> no, um, no. Anyway, so the, so the idea was basically the, um, basically in the course, people would, were just told, do a mindfulness session at a set time on every day. That's it. So that was basically the task. Um, so we we kind of we looked at okay, so the, there were a couple of things we we identified as problematic with this, right? Like you can probably disagree with lots of what we did, but um, what we said, okay, the first real problem is there is uh, there's no real goal here, right? So this is a very a very when when we look at this point. I basically thought about it today, of how can I frame it with this? But um, there was there was no there was basically only a lose condition. You could you could only fail. You could you could just stop doing it, and then you feel bad about yourself. Maybe maybe you just don't feel bad about yourself, but it's just over. So um, so there was no way to be good at this really, other than because you didn't know am I good when I did this twice? Am I good when I did this? A year? Am I a horrible person if I stop that for 15 years? You, you don't really you know. Um, so basically, what we, and this was, was quite interesting um, experience to talk to the psychologists who developed the program. Um, so so what, what could be a goal here, right? Um, what, so after back and forth, uh, basically, we started with the person has to do this for a year, and we we're like, Probably not going to happen, but you use an app every day for a year, and that's the only way when you to get a feel good about yourself moment. So basically, we, we went and broke it down into a, a smaller number of days, and up with uh, I'm not, I think 33 in the end, um, where there's also very set steps on the way there. So basically, we said, okay, after you've done five you've accomplished something, right? So we, we introduced a, a big goal. So that was like the 33 times. You do it 33 times. You don't even have to do it 33 days in a row. Um, you just have to do it on 33 separate days, right? It doesn't, if you take a break for a week and you come back, you're actually going to be rewarded for coming back rather than punished for not being there. Um, so that was the first thing we introduced to, to give people a feeling of how can I be good at this. Uh, we introduced a set goal and we then divided it into like sub goals. We said, okay, if I've done this five times, um, the first visual change happens. So what we did is that we rewarded this mostly visually, the, the page on the India, where you can actually, when you, where you have these, um, these sessions, which are like audio, audio files, which you listen to. Um, this is this, they, they are put behind the puzzle uh, where, you, where you flip over uh, one 
piece every time you, you unlock basically one piece every time you do a session, and these are then put, are put together in, in rows and then it, it develops into a whole picture. The whole thing becomes more and more beautiful um, the longer you play, as if, if, we, if we may uh, use the term. Um, so basically, um, that was, that was the, the first main thing we did, and then um, the other thing was the um, was was two things. A, to, we we gave and this sounds very very basic and to everybody who's 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 familiar with games and game design, it always sounds so basic. But for 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 them, it was kind of yeah, okay, it makes sense. Uh, we didn't think about it. Was to give uh, give an opportunity to, to just just share it with somebody who you who you want to share it with um, at certain steps so you could you could you could share it uh, when you basically introduce a couple of yeah it's it's, it's all you know, of course it's, it's it's a bustle we introduced some edges where you know you complete five five tasks can share with your friend you've done something but you're also informing the friend at the same time that you want to do this in the next couple of days so you kind of create a meeting and a bond between yourself and your peers of um giving this uh, experience um yeah sh sharing the goal a, a sharing the achievement and check B sharing a goal with someone who you who you who you want to share with. Um, so basically the idea of of um, of, of giving meaning to it. Um, also for people who are more um, competitive, this is something probably you're gonna look at in your talk uh, in your talk if we forget that was the um, so people are, are differently motivated um, and for, for people who, who may feel or who, who get in a lot of motivation from competing against each other, we introduced something uh, which we call virtual competition because our client was very, very um, against any kind of leaderboard with this. We didn't, I mean, it doesn't really make sense to give a leaderboard into, you know, a psychological prevention tool. Um, but what we, what we did is we introduced basically um, information to the, to the player, to the user, um, about how he's doing compared to others, right? So we said, okay, you, you're doing better than 85% of the other users, which can be good, you, like, you know, if you, if you keep up then with the information, you, if you keep on doing this, you, you reach uh, the top 5% soon. Um, so, and this, if you, it just doesn't even have to be real, right? You just don't, nobody can check. <laughs> oh, that's not, that's not pretty. <laughs> it's, it's not pretty, it can be, it can be evil, but it, like, we haven't decided on the budget on how you actually implement this, uh, this app yet. So either it'll be fake or it'll be real, uh, depending on the budget, but the general idea remains the same. You can, you can just, you, you give, People who, who draw motivation from comparing their own process against each other, against someone else's, uh, the possibility to do it, to check it um, on a regular basis. Um, and basically, the the, the, the main. Um, but when I looked at when I looked back at this, what we did there uh, with this specific part of the course, this is only one part of, of many. Um, I, I realized uh, this afternoon that really what we did was we tried to turn the um, the whole idea of avoiding to fail in this in this thing into into wanting to win. So we kind of we, we kind of really did what what shall talk about. I hope we kind of did what shall talk about into. Um, we we took away the idea of I I, I cannot fail. I, I should not fail with this this fear, which is especially with people who are. Who, who have psychological problems in their, in their, that can be very distressful into into the I want to achieve uh, goal A, goal B, and then um, yeah, edit something. That's what we did there. Uh, I'm going to spare you with, with another example. Thank you.